Hello again. Welcome back to Notes. This is our third portion. We've already talked about the structure of the digestive system, and we have talked about the function, how the digestive system runs. Now we're going to look at what does your digestive system work on? What molecules? For that, we turn to nutrition. These molecules that you break down are called nutrients, substances used by the body for growth, maintenance, and repair. Some major nutrients are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, cholesterols, fibers, water, and then you have minor nutrients, vitamins, minerals, they kind of help things along, but if you go a little bit of time without your vitamins and minerals, your body's not going to start shutting down. They're not used for energy, per se. I'm sure you've all seen the My Pyramid. We're not going to focus that much on it because, honestly, the food pyramid changes so often. Have a nice balance of all these different grains, vegetables, fruits, oils, milks, sugars, meats, if you have a nice balance of it, you'll be fine. If you're wanting to gain weight, you can probably have more grains. As, as odd as it sounds, if you reduce your exercise and increase your grain intake, you will gain quite a bit of weight. Either that or exercise quite a bit, build muscle mass. If you're wanting to lose weight, the main way that you will probably do that is through fat loss, which... Cutting down on sugar and grains will help with that, as well as increasing exercise. Let's look at each of these sources for major nutrients individually. Carbohydrates mostly derived from plants, because carbohydrates are long chains of sugars and starches. Plants have a lot of of sugars and starches. Exceptions, you do get lactose in milk as that is a sugar that is used to feed babies. And you also get small amounts of glycogens from meats. When your body's not using the sugar, it is stored as glycogen. So if you're eating muscle from animals, you will get a small amount of that stored energy that the animal would have used in its muscles. Lipids. You get satur or saturated fats from animal products most of the time. You can get also some nuts and beans that have some fats in them. Unsaturated fats you get from nuts, seeds, vegetable oils. And finally, cholesterol you get from eggs, meats, and milk. However, there are two different types of cholesterol. HDL and LDL, high-density lipid and low-density lipid. The LDL is better. It is unsaturated, much better than high-density, which tends to be the kind of cholesterol you hear about leading to heart attacks and high blood pressure. However, a lot of that also depends on your family history, your genetics because most of the cholesterol in your body, which we'll talk about later, is produced by you and not eaten through your diet. And finally, we have proteins. Complete proteins contain all the essential amino acids. Most of these are from animal products. Essential amino acids are ones that our bodies cannot make by ourselves, which we will get to in the next slide of what are the essential amino acids. We have to obtain these through our diet since we cannot eat them. Same thing with your skin and vitamin D. Your body requires vitamin D, but you do not make that on your own without some outside help. However, these amino acids you cannot make, period. You have to eat them in your food. Legumes and beans, peanuts, cashews, beans also have proteins, but are incomplete. So if you take meat completely out of your diet, 
and substitute it with peanut butter, yeah, you're getting protein, but it's not a complete protein. You will still need to take different supplements that would get you complete proteins as well. So what are some of those essential uh, amino acids? Things like histidine, tryptophan, methionine, valine, threonine, phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, and lysine. Some of you may have heard about in the Jurassic Park how they prevent them from going crazy is they remove their ability to create lysine. And how that eventually leads to is they will eventually die without lysine. That is true. You yourself will die without lysine. That's why it's important that you eat grains and beans to get all these essential amino acids in them. And then you have vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are used as coenzymes. They help speed up reactions. Found in all major food groups. Vitamins are everywhere. And minerals play many roles in the body. Most mineral-rich foods, vegetables, legumes, milk, some meats, things that come out of the ground tend to have a lot of minerals. Metabolism describes the chemical reactions necessary to maintain life. How does your body use all of these things we talked about, all these nutrients up here? How does your body use them to make sure that you wake up in the morning and that you keep living minute to minute, hour to hour? The two separate reactions are catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is breaking stuff down and that produces energy. Anabolism is is building stuff that tends to take some energy, though much less energy than is released through catabolism. So catabolism would be taking sugars and breaking them down. Anabolism would be, you don't need the sugar right now, let's build it into uh, larger molecules for storage, since we're not using it right now. Carbs are the... Preferred energy source. When you talk about cellular respiration, you're talking about how do you break down a glucose molecule. Glucose is the building block of carbohydrates. It is so common that it is your blood sugar. Let's talk about cellular respiration. We're going to go very briefly over it because I assume you've talked about this in freshman biology a little bit more in depth we're going to go over it very briefly because one you've already had it two we're running out of time again oxygen is needed for this carbon leaves the cells as carbon dioxide hydrogen atoms are combined with oxygen to make water and you replace the phosphorus in the ADP to make ATP you have adenosine diphosphate and then you add another phosphate group to make adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate, ATP, can be broken down to release energy for cellular use. Here's the very basic chemical formula. If you were in eighth grade, you would now be knowing where to put all these coefficients in front of this because they're learning to balance chemical reactions. What fun for them. Glucose plus oxygen results in carbon dioxide and water, and most importantly, energy. 32 often, 32 molecules are produced of ATP for every single glucose molecule. The first step is glycolysis. We have a big glucose molecule. It's got a lot of energy, but we gotta break it down. So we split it into two pyruvic acid that yields ATP, two ATP, one per pyruvic acid. We end with two pyruvic acid. So as you can see, two ATP. Next, Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Produces virtually 
all the carbon dioxide and water that results from the cellular respiration. It also yields a small amount of ATP. Again, we have two ATP produced. The main thing that we are trying to do here is break it down so that we have a lot of individual hydrogen atoms and electrons sitting there waiting to be used in our third step, the electron transport chain. The hydrogen atoms removed during glycolysis and Krebs cycle are delivered to the protein carriers, enzymes. Hey, that's why proteins are important. Hydrogen is split into the hydrogen ions. Hopefully you remember from chemistry, hydrogen, when it exists as a gas, exists as hydrogen uh, bonded to itself. If you break that apart into individual atoms, you have one electron and one hydrogen. If you split it then into a hydrogen ion, just that protein, and then the electron, you can then send that electron through the electron transport chain and it gives off a lot of energy, which we're not going over right now because it is complicated, but it is where you get a lot of the ATP. As you can see, glycolysis produces two. Pyruvic acid going into the Krebs cycle produces two. And then the electron transport chain produces 20 Eight, most of the energy, the reason that you are able to survive and spend as much energy as you can is because of the electron transport chain. It's also why oxygen is needed. If you read this all the way to the end, you'll see that eventually we reunite the removed hydrogen with oxygen. Why do you need to breathe oxygen? Because oxygen is needed as an electron and hydrogen acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. Here is a basic that you can see. Every time you get one of those little yellow squigglies, that is the energy being released that is now available for making the ATP. And as you see at the end, you need an oxygen to accept these electrons. So it's why breathing is very important to you. Technically, you could hold your breath and you'd be fine if you didn't need this oxygen. But you do, because without it, you can't make energy. And as we've talked before, your cells, your muscles, don't store a lot of energy you normally, for your muscles, only have about 10 to 15 seconds worth of energy just sitting there ready to be used. As soon as you start using it up, you've got to quickly make more. What happens if you have too much carbs? You go through a cycle called hypo, hyper, a cycle called hyperglycemia. Hyper is too many, above above the amount of normal glucose in the blood. You can store this as glycogen. If it's still too high, you will then convert it into fat, which is why a high carb diet tends to relate or result in high weight gain because you will gain a lot of fat from all these carbs you are not using. Your body will just convert it into fat. So carbohydrates are polysaccharides, disaccharides made of simple sugars, monosaccharides. Mono, di, and poly tells you how many carbon rings there are. If it is a single ring, it is a monosaccharide, like glucose. If it is a two-sugar ring, such as sucrose, table sugar, that is a disaccharide. And if you have stuff like starch, which can be thousands to millions of glucose uh, rings long. That's a poly. Just means many. Hypo. Low levels of glucose. What happens if this happens? 
your liver breaks down this stored glycogen and releases glucose. It's the reason why at night you don't have to constantly eat because your liver can break down this glycogen and keep your body going. But when you wake up, you tend to be kind of hungry because your glycogen levels went down throughout the night. Fats handled mostly by the liver. You use some fats to make ATP. Your body cells remove fat and cholesterol to build membranes and steroid hormones. Steroids and your cellular membranes are the reasons why you have fats. Remember, your cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. You have a lot of lipids and fats in there. Now what happens if you don't eat a lot of sugar, a lot of starch, a lot of carbs? Well, the second place that your body will go for energy is fats. First, fats must be broken down into acetic acid. Within mitochondria, acetic acid is completely oxidized. You make water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. So you can use this cellular me metabolic furnace. It, it's much easier to do it with monosaccharides, but you can do it with fatty acids and with, as you can see, amino acids, with proteins. All of those can easily be turned into ATP. Sugars are the first easiest because you can immediately turn them in. Fatty acids and amino acids have to be converted before they can run through it. Fat metabolism is called acidosis. If you go into severe acidosis, it's ketoacidosis. This res results from incomplete fat oxidation, oxidation, in which you have acetone and acetoacetic acid building up in the blood. The number one way you can tell if you are at this stage is to have someone smell your breath. If it smells very sweet, you've gone into ketoacidosis. That's how you used to be able to tell if uh, someone's blood sugar was getting way too low when they were in diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. You could smell their breath. It was very sweet because they're having to break down all these fats, which you could then smell on their breath. Common with no carb diets. So the keto diet, if you follow a true 100% no carb diet, after a couple days, your breath will take on a sweet smell. Most keto diets are low carb, not completely no carb. It's also, as I said, from uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and also from starvation. If you just don't feed yourself, eventually your body will start breaking down the fat in your body. That will result in a sweet smell of your breath. Proteins are mostly used for cellular structures and must be broken down into amino acid. Your cells then remove amino acids to build proteins. They use the amino acids to build proteins that the RNA. The RNA comes out, you get that mRNA going to the ribosomes saying, all right, here's your instructions. Well, where do we get these amino acids to build stuff that the instructions tell us? from the proteins we've broken down. Amino acids are used to make ATP only when there are too many proteins or not enough sugars or fats. If your body has sugars and starches, it will use those to get energy. If your body doesn't have that, it will go to fats to get energy. If it doesn't have starches or fats, it will then move to protein. That's why if you look at pictures of people from the Holocaust, you'll see they're very thin, but also they have very little muscular tone. Why? Because their body has run through fats, run through starches, and is now breaking down their muscle mass. So your body will eat your muscles and proteins, but only as a last resort. Because proteins 
you've got to do a lot of converting and they're very important to your body. So your body only uses them if it's absolutely necessary. They can't get energy anywhere else. How it does it would be removing those amine groups from the proteins as ammonia. The rest of the protein molecule then enters the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. The problem is ammonia is poisonous to your body. So that ammonia then has to go to the liver to be converted to urea, which then can be eliminated in urine. Proteins break down into amino acids. You can, can use it for energy. It's not very beneficial. So why do you have your liver? Manufactured biles also detoxifies drugs and alcohol. It's why if you are an alcoholic, eventually you will get severe liver disease or your liver will just shut down. Because how do you get that out of your blood? Through your liver. It also degrades hormones, produces cholesterol and blood proteins, and helps with metabolism. It can regenerate if part of it is damaged or removed. Every time that you uh, send alcohol and drugs through it, part of it is damaged. But only a tiny part. It can regenerate that pretty easily. The problem is if you do it repeatedly, over long periods of time, and you don't give it a chance to breathe, eventually the damage becomes severe enough that it has trouble repairing itself and eventually can't repair itself. That's where you get liver disease. Metabolic functions. Glycogenesis. Glycogen formation. You have extra sugar that your body doesn't need right now. We're going to turn the glucose into glycogen and store it in the liver. Glycogenolysis, glucose splitting. You need the sugar now? We'll release it from the liver after breaking apart the glycogen. And gluconeogenesis, formation of new sugar. You're not eating a lot of carbs? That's okay. Your liver can take your fats and your proteins and convert it to glucose. That's what I was saying of you can use fats and proteins for energy, but it takes a little bit of converting if you want to go through the full electron transport chain and get everything through all cellular respiration. So if you have too much blood sugar, you get glycogenesis. You turn glucose into glycogen. If your blood sugar starts falling, you can either... Take your stored glycogen and convert it to glucose through glycogenolysis. Or, if you don't have this glycogen, do gluconeogenesis. Amino acids and fats are converted to glucose. It picks up fats and fatty acids. Some are oxidized to provide energy for the liver. The rest are just broken down and released into the blood. And finally, cholesterol. It's not used to make ATP at all. It's used as a structural basis for steroids and vitamin D. And it's a major building block of plasma membranes, your cellular membranes. Most cholesterol is produced in the liver, 85%. So genetics plays a huge role in how much cholesterol your body carries. Only about 15% of your cholesterol is taken from your diet. They can't circulate in the bloodstream, however. They're not regularly water soluble. So they are transported by lipid protein complexes. Low density lipoproteins transport to body cells. These are the bad lipoproteins. So I got it wrong. I said earlier in the video that LDL was good. I mixed it up. I got it wrong. LDLs are considered bad because they can lead to atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries. And high-density lipoproteins, HDLs, 
those transport from body cells to the liver. And we're going to say that is it. Thank you for this long sitting with me for the long video. And that is probably going to wrap it up for the PowerPoint for this chapter. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Next chapter is urinary system. We talked about making urea. How does your body make urea? Normally, from your blood. And how do you get rid of urea? 